All right, hi everybody. This is David Turner, and I'm teaching this class on um, server programming, CSC 405. And uh, what we see here is the course uh, website. And uh, this will be the main source of information for you throughout the quarter. And uh, as you can see here, I have some explanation on how the class is going to be run. I've got a link to the syllabus some previous courses that are relevant, and um, some other stuff. Uh, so let me, uh, let me get everybody oriented here and um, try not to be take too long. Uh, so uh, this is, um, this could be a very important course for a lot of you because it, it covers material that's very practical. There's a lot of um, jobs, the jobs that are in the software development industry, a lot of those jobs deal with learning the techniques that uh, we're gonna cover in this class. Learning the, the, the techniques and the, the technologies. There's so many different technologies now, it's just um, humongous. It's so hard to keep up with everything. And um, I've slipped a little bit in some areas, and uh, but really it's not, when there's so much going on, it's, uh, it's not really possible for any one person to really keep up with everything. So just, you know, that's something that I mean, everybody knows. You just have to keep that in mind as you make decisions. You'll be making decisions about what, where you want to put your energy, where you want to put your time and energy, and what you need to skip over. <coughs> So there's so many topics that could be covered in this course. It's um, it's gigantic, and uh, and the thing about sticking to um, a specific sequence of topics, I mean, it's it's good and 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 not good. It's not good if the student is uh, already familiar with those topics and doesn't need a review. Although usually reviews are good. And um, or they're not interested, or they have other needs. Maybe this, maybe the person, the student is already working, and they need to direct their energy toward learning the tools that are used by their employer. And uh, it would be uh, draining to uh, to have to learn something uh, differently that didn't uh, that sort of took away their time and energy. So. If you're in that situation where you're already, this is just one example. If you're in a situation where you're already employed and there's a certain set of techniques or technologies that you ought to master uh, given your, your situation, and that's what you should be doing. And uh, I don't want to uh, force you to, uh, to follow the topics in this class if, uh, if this is going to interfere with uh, what you need to get done. So for that reason, I uh, made this pretty flexible. So you can have a self-defined assignment. There it is right there. Self-defined assignments. And I just gave one example where a self-defined assignment is, uh, is uh, justified or uh, reasonable. And there's, there's, uh, there's many other possible scenarios where you could justify a self-defined set of assignments. So you can basically treat the class as a type of independent study and uh, submit to me uh, your, um, your self-defined assignments, what you want to do, and read the details in here. And um, you'll need to become familiar with this. I should go, let me read it. I'll go through this with you. So there's a set of default course assignments, and that's those are topics that I'm going to present on. I'll create videos and demonstrate these things. And I have it broken into uh, six assignments. <clears throat> this is not six weeks. These are just six assignments. You can, you can complete the first three assignments in the first week, if you like. And, uh, but each week, I want a, uh, a progress report. Uh, sent to me by uh, email. And uh, you could either be made partial progress on one assignment or have finished an assignment and finished another one and started the third one, whatever. 
So it's pretty flexible. The course is pretty flexible. Now this sequence here, it's a logical sequence. So it's, it's hard to do this other than following these steps here. Uh, so uh, a lot of technologies, uh, web development technologies, the computer science in general has that characteristic that to do work in some area, there's a lot of prerequisites. And sometimes the prerequisites make a, a linear sequence. Uh, in this case, uh, it's not 100% linear, but pretty much uh, this is a, a reasonable sequence, I believe. So those are the default assignments. And then uh, there's a default grade calculation. And you can read through that. And uh, now there's self-defined assignments. So if, now, the very first thing that's due in the class is this R&D proposal, right there. Research and development proposal. This is the submission window. It started yesterday. Best day to submit was yesterday. I got two submissions yesterday. So that's great that people already got, found their way to the syllabus and started the work. That's good. So these submission windows, I don't accept anything outside the window. So just go right ahead and submit to me on day one of the window. See, the second window of submissions is April 11 to April 17. Just submit it to me on April 11. Why wait? Just do it. Um, but some people like to be under some pressure, I think, to get things in or whatever. So you can submit the April 17, I call it April 17, there it is. That's the end of the submission window. The April 17 progress report can be submitted on April 11th. That's the earliest time to submit that. So you have one week to submit these, uh, these reports. And as you can see, there's a number of reports here. So you need to submit one of these to me each during each of these windows. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So there's nine emails minimum that you need to send to me uh, to, get, uh, to get a top grade, whatever you're shooting for. And they got to send me nine emails in the submission windows. No late emails are accepted. You can't send me the May 22nd progress report on May 23. Whatever you send to me on May 23 is considered a May 29 progress report. Okay. All right. So now in your progress reports, you can make the first email that you send to me is your R&D proposal. And it could be as simple as saying, I'm going to stick to the default assignments. So you just tell me that. You send me an email with one sentence in it. And that's your first submission. You can do that right away. That's the R&D proposal right there. So you can say, I'm not going to detail anything about what I'm going to study. I'm just going to follow the default assignments, which is right here, one through six. And these are assignments. This is technology I'll be presenting on. Uh, once you, now, if you don't want to follow that list of default assignments, you make up your own statement about what you're going to be doing. So then you send that to me in an email. Now don't send attachments to email. Just send me the information in the body of the email. I don't want to have to open attachments. You can send me links. If you want to send me a link to a Google Doc or something, that's, that's, but not for the reports. This should be the, inside the emails themselves, these reports and the proposal. Send them in the body of the email, not as a separate link. But for other material, like your source code and so on, don't send me source code in the email. Don't send me an attachment. Send me a link to your source code that's online. And that'll be easy to do because we're going to be using GitHub. And you simply send me a link to your GitHub repository. Don't send me one link in your first report and just assume that I'm going to go back and dig up your earlier report to find the link. Send me the link or whatever links you have, send me them in each report you submit. And don't make me search for the link. It takes, I got 60 students and I have a lot of emails to manage. So I don't want to have to be searching for links when you can just 
put them in the email, the one that you sent to me. All right. So uh, academic integrity, you know, it doesn't, you, you can get an A in the class without impressing me. You just do the work. If you do all the work, you'll just get an A. And you don't need, if, if, you're, if you're entry level, if you're at the beginning, uh, your skill level is low. I mean, that's just where you are. And uh, you don't have to pretend to be something, uh, someone with, uh, with more skill. You don't need to present that to me. Uh, you could be honest. And uh, if you're at a very low introductory level, that's where you're at. And um, you don't want to be caught up in trying to pretend to, uh, to have more skill than you really do. And these are hard assignments. I've say this default set of assignments are pretty tough. This is really tough. This material is not easy. And uh, well, that's one of the reasons why it's there's jobs out there because it's it's hard to do. This material is hard to master. And um, so keep that in mind. And um, and you don't have to impress me. You just have to follow the instructions. Get these progress reports submitted to me on a timely basis. That's the main thing you got to do. And Keep your integrity. Don't submit work that you didn't do. Or if, you, if there's a big chunk of code that you copied from somewhere to get your system working, just make a note that that's where it came from. It came from this other place and provide a link. And, whatnot. and that's common. Everybody grabs code. I copy code all the time. You know, it's, it, you're supposed to. You've got an API and you look in the documentation, they got a code snippet in there. You know, you, you copy it. I have a little code snippet from the API documentation. It's not a big deal. You don't really need to document that. But if you're in a tutorial and you grab a big chunk of code from the tutorial and you paste it in there, you, you got to make a note of where you got it from. So that's academic integrity. So don't be careful. Don't, don't misrepresent your work because that's a guaranteed failing grade right there. Don't represent yourself. You don't have to worry about impressing me on how much work you do. All you got to do is being consistent and get these progress reports submitted to me. Just be consistent and honest. It's good. It's good enough to get an A. All right. So uh, coming back to the default course assignments here. These are, like I said, these are tough. And, you know, when I teach a class, I like to use it as an opportunity to learn myself. And I'm, I'm kind of a learning person. I, I'm a bit addicted to it. I'm always wanting to learn something new all the time. And um, I got into that habit. And I think one of the reasons I got into the habit is because I noticed early on, I realized early on that in, the, in this in industry in particular, but it's true about life in general, but in this software development industry in particular, you can't just learn one thing and stay put and, and expect to, uh, to be employed and, and productive with that. You've got to, things are changing all the time. They're going so fast. You've got to make a habit of doing research and expanding your knowledge and skills on your own. You just have to, you know, if you've got a job and you've got a desk and you go in there and you sit down every day and you're, and you're, you're asked to do things and you, you're going to carry out tasks that don't provide any learning to you at all. And uh, you have to do those, of course. But don't just do those. You have to be disciplined. Carve out a certain amount of time every day to tackle something new, to learn something new. So you want to get in the habit of learning something new. And um, anyway, that's a habit I developed. And I, I've worked in the industry beyond. I haven't always been a teacher. I've also been a programmer and, um, and other things. I've done other jobs as well. Actuary, I was an actuary for a while and transportation planner and a whole bunch of stuff. So, and I can tell you that it's, it's very useful and necessary to develop the habit of, um, of self-improvement. 
you take the time, carve out the time to learn something new. Every day, if possible. Uh, so here we have the list. Now this list here, I don't know. These are things on here, many things on here that, well not many, there's only six. Uh, some of these areas like Firebase, you know, I've never used Firebase. And um, I'm finding this very tough. And that's just, it's so complicated. That I'm very familiar with the lower levels. I mean, I started out by writing web servers and, and email servers in C and, uh, or C++. And, um, and I kind of worked my way up in terms of layers of complexity. And if you look at this web, web development, uh, area in general, it's um, it started out like all things is being very simple. Most like academics, computer science academics, basically could look it over and say, "Oh, that's HTML. That's how that works. Oh, this is a web server. That's the socket connections. That's how it's done. Uh, see, it's a internet protocol, and on top of that is a TCP, and TCP is used to transport the HTTP messages. It's a request response paradigm. Okay, got it, move on, next thing. And uh, so, you know, in the beginning, it was, uh, it was kind of like a trivial topic, almost, uh, networking and, uh, and web development in particular. But uh, it is uh, because of its importance, um, I suppose, uh, its usefulness. It's grown in complexity a lot, very quickly. I'd say over 20 years. I've been watching it grow over 20 years uh, from the beginning here. And the internet started getting popular back in the late 1990s. And um, it's so complicated now. Where was I getting at? Oh, yeah, so Firebase, the uh, it's it's uh, it's amazing. Firebase is a company that was uh, I don't know how it got started, but it was uh, the company that created these uh, uh, systems to uh, to uh, let uh, people to developers develop uh, distributed applications more easily. And Google purchased Firebase, so Google is in control of Firebase. Just like YouTube, you know, Google didn't invent YouTube. YouTube is bought by, or, sorry, by, uh, YouTube is bought by Google. Firebase is bought by Google, right? GitHub is bought by Microsoft. Is that right? GitHub is bought by Microsoft. There we go. Did Microsoft buy recently. Anyway, I can't remember that. But all these big companies, uh, they, they buy these, uh, Anything that's of great value or a threat, like MySQL is, I think, a threat to Oracle. So Oracle bought MySQL. You know, these large companies have a lot. And so Firebase was embraced by Google. Google has um, sort of been promoting it. And it's, uh, it really is a killer uh, resource. I mean, they give you so much. And I'm going to, and I'm learning that right now. Okay. Yeah. I wanted to get all six of these steps done myself personally before the class started. I said, okay, this is what I'm going to learn. These are the default assignments. I, I got to be able to do it myself. And I got the first five done. And I am now on step six, creating a web app. Uh, so step six is the culminating activity where you, you create some application using these technologies. The technologies identify in this list one through five, use them to make this web app. And the web app that I'm making, and you know what, you don't have time to do a lot, so you've got to keep this really, really simple. The web app I'm trying to make is just a simple tic-tac-toe app where a user goes online, they go to the web page, they go to the website, the tic-tac-toe app website, and they invite a friend to play with them. And the friend gets an email. And the friend clicks the email. And now they're both looking at the same web page. And uh, 
one, one player goes first, they put an X down, the other player goes second, they put a zero down, an O down, and so on until they finish the game. So that sounds pretty simple. And that's, that's the level of web app I'm sort of expecting for, for the course. And I mean, if you could get that done, I'd be pretty happy. I, want, uh, I guess I was going to use the word impressed, but um, it doesn't sound that hard. And it really isn't. If you're familiar with this Firebase technology, that app that I just described, you could bang that out in an afternoon or less. I mean, if you're a master of this technology, really an afternoon at the most. And, um, but I, for me, it's taking me, I've spent some days now on, on Firebase and I'm, I'm just starting to uh, chip away at it. It's, it's, it's like a, it's monolithic, it's gigantic. And um, maybe monolithic isn't the right word. That's not right, right? It's, but it's gigantic and it's, uh, and it's got some style to it that I'm just not uh, familiar with. You know, they like to use TypeScript and uh, I have never used TypeScript. I've spent a lot in the documentation and presentations and so on. But uh, anyway, that's where I'm at. And if you wanted to learn this Firebase, you know, that's, that's what you're going to get with the default course assignments. And as you go through this, it's going to be, it could be pretty challenging. I mean, really challenging. I'm just learning, learning how to use Git. I mean, Git is so important. I mean, that's, you could spend a lot of time on that. And I'm, I'm still learning Git. I'm still learning it. After all these years, I've been using it. And I just haven't been using it to its fullest. And uh, in particular, one of the areas that I've been weak on is using uh, branch and Git. And, uh, that's the reason uh, I started using branching recently after years of using Git, and I haven't really been a significant user of branches. I just started using branching. I want to show you this link. There's a lecture link I got up there. And I made a, a note here. This is the web page that I looked at and, uh, and studied and Git branching, as well as other resources, too. But this is a very good presentation of how branches work. In, uh, in GitHub, and after reading this, then I've started using branches. Although I, I got away from it a little bit recently. So that's Git, Git branches, uh, Git pull request. That's um, you know what is this? Um, I've never submitted pull request. So oh yeah, this is where you're contributing to other projects. If you want to um, contribute a, a fix, just a, a small change to an open source project. You can fork your project. See, there's a forking command up there. And uh, you can fork their project to make a change and then submit to them a pull request. You say, look, I fixed the bug. Go ahead and integrate it in with uh, what you could. Now, I've never done that. So that's another area that just, just to show you, uh, I don't know everything here. And uh, But Git is so um, indispensable these days. Even if you're not going to use it for your own projects, you're going to um, you're going to have to deal with it when it comes to uh, looking at other people's projects and maybe even joining in a team that's using Git. So it's very common. Now GitHub is, uh, I think GitHub was purchased by Microsoft. But it, it's the most popular online system that provides Git. Now you can, you don't need GitHub. There's others, there's a Bitbucket and there's uh, others as well. And you, you can create your own uh, Git server as well. You don't need GitHub to set it up on your own server. I've done that, I've got notes on that if you want it. And, or you could just use Git just to do your own management of your stuff you use uh, I use flash drives a lot in the backup uh, I set up uh, remote repositories on flash drives and write my stuff there if I don't want to put it in the cloud uh, so uh, git is um, it's indispensable and uh, I don't know if I can say anything more than that well why is it indispensable well it's uh, maybe I could talk about that as we go along but it's so important that 
I mean, at a minimum, you got to learn this. And uh, if you want to go into software development. Okay, the second one, JavaScript and JSON. Uh, but JSON is a minor topic, but you'll see it's everywhere. But JavaScript could be the most important language to pick up right now in this moment. It's heavily used for um, you know, the web-based uh, web -based applications, and also in mobile apps. It's heavily used. It's used so much now. It's, it's, it's just getting uh, so it's, it's such an important language. It's worth learning on its own. And if you develop for the web, uh, then uh, you're going to need to deal with JavaScript. People can, can use alternatives to JavaScript, like uh, TypeScript, for instance. I think that was developed by Microsoft. Or you could use CoffeeScript. Or you can use Dart, uh, and there's some others too. So, the, what these other languages do when they're, you see, the, they're, you can write code in these other languages like uh, TypeScript, but when the code needs to run in the browser, the code is translated into JavaScript. So, it's compiled into JavaScript. The JavaScript is like the, it's like the assembly language of the web. And, uh, you know, it's something that other languages compile into, or you could call it the, with the byte code, like in .NET, you know, in .NET, all the different languages compile to byte code and run in the, in the .NET virtual machine. And um, JavaScript is similar, so it's, it's running, other, other languages compile into JavaScript, and JavaScript run, runs in the JavaScript engine within the browser or within uh, your, your level level design tool like Unity or it runs inside of a, a Node.js server-side application or runs inside of another context. So JavaScript can run in many different contexts. It doesn't only run in the browser. Now, JSON is short for JavaScript Object Notation, and that is becoming ubiquitous. I mean, it's just everywhere. So if you interact with uh, a distributed application somewhere, you have to exchange data, you have to talk to that, that remote endpoint, that remote system, we'll call it. And a lot of times, more often than not, these days, the messages the data that's carried in the messages are in the form of JSON, JavaScript object notation. So it's, it gives you a nice tree structure. You know, you've got an object and it's got attributes. And the attributes could be other ob objects. It's kind of like folders within folders and files within folders. It's, it's got a nice um, uh, sort of tree-like structure to it. It's very easy to work for machine code to interact with JSON, it's also very easy for humans to examine what's going on by looking at the JSON. The JSON is a string. It's a string representation of data. And it's, and it's uh, relatively straightforward for humans to read it and to understand it. So that helps with debugging. So JSON is highly important. Even if you don't use JavaScript, you're gonna end up using JSON anyway. You know, if you're a Python programmer, you're going to be using JSON. You name it, you're, you're going to end up using JSON, especially if you want to interact with other systems on the internet. It's also used a lot for configuration too, so it could simply be configuration files as well. So this is a big topic. But they're simple. JSON is simple. The JavaScript is not as simple. And then Node.js, that's the server-side system for um, that uses JavaScript. It's it's for the doing server-side logic. And uh, we'll take a look at that. And I usually teach this class, well, not usually, but I have taught this class where we just worked with Node.js and did our implementations from Node.js. We ran that, you know, inside of a folder and uh, we had clients connect to it and so on. But uh, I think for the default assignments, I'm going to go for something different. Now, Node.js does 
is a part of Firebase in the, um, uh, actually I don't have it in the list here, but there's something called uh, Fire, uh, Firebase uh, Functions. And uh, Firebase Functions are essentially Node.js no programs. And uh, that's something that I'm using now to build this uh, to tech to web app. But I didn't cover it separately here. Firebase functions, but that I'll be covering that in this step six. And uh, so that's Node.js, and um, you'll see this is this is pretty big now. And you could use Node.js for a lot of things. I use it for uh, video game development. I use it to uh, almost like a Python, where you could use it to pre-process art assets, and uh, so it's very handy. It's, it's such a handy language. So anyway, uh, Firebase, Firebase Auth, that's this fourth topic here. So Auth means authentication, authentication. And authentication means like, you know, logging in. And there's so many different ways that uh, you can accomplish authentication these days. And authentication is not simple. Authentication is tough. And these days, when you go to a, let's suppose you go to a new website and you need to establish your identity. So you have to register. You can register the standard way, the old way is you take a username, a password, type that in there, establish it, maybe verify through an email link. So you can get your password, you can change it through your email. And that's the old way. And it's still a good way. And, uh, but then you can also make it more convenient for the users. Like, well, I'll authenticate to the app through uh, my Google ID or my GitHub ID or my Twitter ID. So all these systems, you know, GitHub, Twitter, Facebook, you name it. I mean, this, this list goes on and on. Um, they all provide a, um, a form of third party authentication. So once you, Establish your identity, say with Google, and then you want to, uh, to use someone's app, and their app says, "Oh, you can, you can just let me know who you are uh, by by um, by authenticating through to Google." So your password, it's more secure for you as a user because you, your password is going directly to Google. You're not channeling your password through the app. So the app doesn't handle any of your passwords. So it's, uh, there's a protocol called OAuth, which is, um, which is used for this. And it's, uh, it's interesting. So this Firebase authentication system uh, lets you make use of uh, many different uh, authentication uh, techniques and you can add them all together. So some users can authenticate by picking their own username and password. Others can authenticate using pure email interaction. Others can authenticate using Google. Others, uh, Twitter, their Twitter identity or whatever. So there's so many opportunities there. We're going to look at that. I found that very confusing to learn how to get this to work. But I got that working, so I'll demonstrate that to you later. Cloud Firestore, and uh, this is a uh, like a database technology, and this is something that um, you know I'm learning how to use. This is fantastic. I mean, I'll probably do more comments on that later. And then finally, this uh, web app. So I want to use these. Um, all these technologies to uh, to build something, and these are this is all very cutting edge. You know, it's not like building an app that's written in PHP using old code that you found in some tutorials that are ten years or twenty or fifteen years old. You know, th this is your cutting edge approach to building a web application. And I'm going to take a short break and then continue in a, uh, in a moment.